Hey everyone, and welcome back to Crisis of Crime. My name is Rachel Means, and I'm a criminologist. Thank you for joining me for my weekly podcast where we talk about criminology and criminal justice reform. And just a quick warning to all listeners, today's content is quite graphic. Today I want to talk about the Jeffrey Curley murder. Not just about how he was murdered and why, but also about victimization, especially in regards to the routine activities theory. So the routine activities theory tells us that we need to have a motivated offender, a suitable target, and the lack of capable guardianship. So the lack of capable guardianship is what I really want to talk about today when it comes to Jeffrey Curley, because when people get victimized, our gut reaction is to only blame the people who were the perpetrators of the crime. So in the case of Jeffrey Curley, we only want to blame the murderers in that case. But in reality, especially when it comes to criminal theory, there are a lot of other factors that, for this example, put Jeffrey into the situation that he was in. So it's important that we look at all aspects of what was going on at the time and what contributed to his victimization. The murder of Jeffrey Curley was one of the first in Massachusetts to receive international media attention. This story took the country by storm. It even made its way all the way up to Canada. The scene at the courthouse when Salvador Cesari was being brought in for the trial of Jeffrey Curley's murder was that of havoc. It was like an ocean of reporters that needed to be parted to reach the door. Because the news had spread so fast and so far, Cesari was required to wear a bulletproof vest through the crowd, while reporters were elbowing each other in attempts to get a quote on the question on everyone's mind. Why did you do it? Jeffrey Curley was a bright-eyed, adventurous 10-year-old living near Cambridge, Massachusetts. He was 4 foot 6, 77 pounds, with blue eyes and dark brown hair. His parents often said that he seemed older than he was because of his street smarts and fearlessness. Jeffrey would often hang out with the older kids and young adults in the neighborhood, one of which was Salvador Cesari, who ultimately introduced Jeffrey to Charles Janes. Charles Janes was a pedophile. He was a member of the North American Man-Boy Love Association, or NAMBLA, and yes, that is a real association. And Janes believed that young men and boys should be able to have legal sexual relationships. Janes became obsessed with Jeffrey and began formulating a plan to get Jeffrey to have sex with him. Janes stalked Jeffrey for two weeks and decided to buy him a bike in exchange for sex. On October 1st of 1997, Charles Janes, along with Salvador Cesari, met with Jeffrey Curley in attempts to make his proposition a Trek 97 bike, and $50 in cash, in exchange for a sexual favor. The three were riding around in Jane's Cadillac and had pulled over in an alley to relieve themselves when Jane's made his first move. Jeffrey was initially filled with joy to receive a new bike, but his joy quickly turned to childlike confusion and fear when Jane's told him what he wanted in return. Jeffrey, not even fully understanding what Jane's was demanding, was horrified. Janes immediately erupted with anger, grabbing Jeffrey and slamming him into the backseat of the Cadillac. Cesari saw the commotion out of the corner of his eye and quickly climbed into the driver's seat of the car and began to drive away. At only 77 pounds, Jeffrey struggled in the backseat under Janes's 300-pound body. In an attempt to subdue Jeffrey, Janes reached for a gasoline-soaked rag and covered Jeffrey's face, forcing him to inhale the fumes. His face, lungs, eyes, and nose all burned and began to form blisters. The struggle between the two lasted for 20 minutes until Jeffrey's small body couldn't take it anymore, and he died. Janes and Cesari immediately began devising a cover-up plan and headed for the hardware store where they bought a tarp and duct tape. Then, like a true psychopath, Janes went to work while Cesari removed Jeffrey's body from the back seat, wrapped him in a tarp, and then placed him in the trunk. After work, Janes and Cesari went to Home Depot and purchased a large Rubbermaid container, bags of cement, and lime. James and Cesari made their way to Janes's apartment building where, under the cover of night, they snuck in Jeffrey's body and their supplies. I want to warn listeners that this is where it gets very graphic. Once inside, Janes laid out Jeffrey's body, taking it out of the tarp and removing all of the boy's clothes. Janes grabbed a Coors light bottle and covered the top with Vaseline, 
and then inserted it into Jeffrey's rectum. He joked that the boy was getting stiff and encouraged Cesari to sodomize him as well, which Cesari did not partake in. Janes then flipped Jeffrey over and began to have sex with his corpse, pausing to turn him over and manipulate Jeffrey's penis with his mouth, hands, and feet. Once Janes finished engaging in necrophilia, he and Cesari began the process of disposing of Jeffrey's body. They placed him in the Rubbermaid container along with the cement and lime. They then drove from Massachusetts to Maine, where they dumped Jeffrey's body into the Piscataqua River. Flash forward to the trial of Salvador Cesari and Charles Janes. Charles Janes was charged with second degree murder as they were not able to bring enough evidence against him to convict him of first degree murder. Janes and his lawyer did everything they could to pin the crime on Salvador Cesari, who was charged with first-degree murder and life in prison without parole, following his confession that he had witnessed the murder and rape of Jeffrey Curley and his involvement with the disposal of his body. So yes, the man who actually murdered and raped Jeffrey got second-degree murder, while the witness who helped with the body removal got first-degree murder. There is a book about Jeffrey Curley's murder. It is called The Ride, The Jeffrey Curley Murder and Its Aftermath by Brian McQuarrie. So if you do decide to read the book, one of the most notable topics was Bob Curley's stance on the death penalty. In the beginning, he wants both Janes and Cesari to receive capital punishment, but as time went on, he actually became an advocate against the death penalty. So the book is really interesting and in how Bob Curley progresses throughout it. Let's talk about victimization, specifically in regards to the routine activities theory. As I mentioned in the beginning, for the routine activities theory, you have to have three things. You have to have a motivated offender, a suitable target, and a lack of capable guardianship. So in this example, our motivated offender is Charles Janes, our suitable target is Jeffrey Curley, and was there a lack of capable guardianship? That is what we are going to talk about. The Curley family was not the wealthiest, as they lived on the lower income side of East Cambridge, Massachusetts. Jeffrey's parents were divorced, and he and his older brothers all lived with his mother. Jeffrey's father, Bob, lived close by in a condo. Jeffrey's mother, Barbara Curley, went back to work full-time after the divorce, and Jeffrey's older brothers, Bob Jr. and Sean, were much older and were rarely around the house. So right there, it's showing that there is a lack of capable guardianship. His mom is working full time, his dad doesn't live at home, and his two older brothers are much older than him and are rarely home. So now we have two risk factors. We have this lack of capable guardianship and it's a lower income family, both of which are factors that can increase someone's potential victimization. So because of this lack of capable guardianship, this gave Jeffrey plenty of time to himself. He would often visit his grandmother and also hang out with his friends. And as I mentioned, there were individuals in his neighborhood who were bad news, people that Jeffrey should not have been hanging out with, like Salvador Cesari. Ultimately, this is the root cause of why he was in the situation that he was in in the first place. This is how he met Salvador Cesari, who then introduced him to Charles Janes. As I mentioned, Janes was a pedophile and he saw a potential victim in Jeffrey. He was that motivated offender who saw Jeffrey as a suitable target. The fact that Jeffrey didn't have adequate supervision, nor did his parents take a firmer stance on him hanging around individuals like Cesari, because they were aware that he was hanging out with him. This ultimately led to the opportunistic situation that resulted in Jeffrey's death. If Jeffrey's parents or his brothers were home more often to provide that guardianship and kept a close eye on who he was hanging out with, then it likely would have kept him safe. And this goes for the neighborhood as well. As I mentioned, it's a lower income area. Lower income neighborhoods tend to lack social cohesion and trust because since it's lower income, it tends to have more tenant turnover. Therefore, neighbors don't know each other as well and therefore they're not looking out for each other as much. When you get into higher class neighborhoods, there's a higher chance that there's a neighborhood watch program, that people own their homes and have lived there for a longer time, and they're more likely to speak up if they see any kind of suspicious activity or criminal activity. So this brings up this idea of shared responsibility, which is a very controversial topic because it aims to share the responsibility of the victim's victimization 
not just with the perpetrator, but in this case, with other people who were around Jeffrey. In some cases of shared responsibility, the victim has some of the responsibility. In the case of Jeffrey Curley, because he was so young, it wasn't his responsibility to be regulating his behavior and being his own guardian. That was the responsibility of his family and his community. So the Curley family itself is not completely innocent when it comes to shared responsibility. The Curley family falls under the second dimension of victim proneness. Victim proneness occurs when an individual's daily routine includes movement in dangerous locations, living in high crime locations, working in unprotected neighborhoods, or socializing with violent or crime-related individuals. So even though Jeffrey was very young, he was only 10 years old, it's likely that he knew that Cesare was bad news, but he just wasn't able to really process what that meant. So the majority of the victim responsibility falls onto Bob and Barbara Curley. So they knew that their son was hanging around with Salvador Cesare, and they had told him on multiple occasions not to hang out with him. But in the end, they were not proactive enough in stopping him from engaging with Cesare. And it's because that Jeffrey was able to hang out with Cesare that he was ultimately introduced to Jane's. Now, Jeffrey's parents were not aware of who Jane's was or his violent nature. Now, if you do decide to read the book, you will find that Bob Curley was full of regret after Jeffrey was murdered because he felt like he didn't do enough to protect his son. Now, in this case of Jeffrey Curley, Jeffrey Curley was, of course, the victim. He received the most victimization in this situation, but the Curley family as a whole was also victimized by the situation, and throughout the court proceedings, they were continually victimized. So I want to talk a quick bit about re-victimization in the criminal justice system. The prime example of when the Curley family was re-victimized within the criminal justice system was during the trial of Charles Janes. Because of the insufficient evidence, he was only charged with second-degree murder. As I mentioned before, after Jeffrey was murdered, his father, Bob Curley, was very adamant about trying to have Janes and Cesare put to death. So much so that Bob was involved with trying to get a bill passed in Massachusetts that would legalize the death penalty. Now, Congress in Massachusetts did not pass this bill, but because of that, Bob was re-victimized again as it felt as if justice was not being served since his son's murderers were still alive, being able to wake up each day and look outside and see the sun, something that his son was not able to do anymore. Another example of when the Curley family was re-victimized was when Bob Curley attempted to sue the North American Man-Boy Love Association, or NAMBLA. He was attempting to sue them for the wrongful death of his son because Charles Janes was a member. The lawsuit was ultimately unsuccessful because of the First Amendment, which says that each and every American has the freedom to speech and expression. Because NAMBLA is an association where grown men can come together and talk about how they want to engage in sexual relationships with young boys, but they don't actually engage with them through this organization. It's just a group where people can gather and express their opinions and say what they want to say. So that freedom of speech and expression, they could not be held accountable for Charles Jane's actions. Because of the multiple setbacks and re-victimizations of Bob Curley, he eventually went on a downward spiral. He was unable to function and eventually turned to alcoholism. He finally attended rehab and realized that he was allowing his son's murderers to destroy his life as well. And that is when he changed his views on the death penalty. I do highly recommend that you guys read the book, The Ride. It is very insightful, has a lot of good information, not just about the actual case if you're into true crime, but from a criminology perspective as well. One of the things that I found most interesting in the book is the interactions between Salvador Cesari and the police in the community after the murder had happened because Cesari comes back to the community, back to the neighborhood, and begins following the search for Jeffrey because the way that he behaves, he tries to be very helpful and asks a lot of questions and wants to know what's going on. And that kind of behavior actually alerts investigators that this person 
is trying to get information on this case because they have a lot invested in it. And that was ultimately what led police to figuring out that Sasari was involved, who then turned in Jane's and gave his whole statement, which did end up getting him first degree murder because he divulged all the details. And then Charles Jane's got second degree murder. So that part is not ideal, but it is a very interesting book. So I highly suggest that you guys check it out. Thank you so much for listening today. I really appreciate it. If you would like to learn more about me and what it is that I do, please visit my website at www.crisisofcrime.com. There you will find all of my podcasts as well as my YouTube videos and my links to social media. If you are interested in supporting me and my podcast and other videos, I do have a Patreon support tab on my website where you can sign up to become a patron. Another great way to support me is just to like and share this content. If you are interested in seeing more videos from me, please consider subscribing to my channel. You can hit the bell so you are notified anytime that I put out a new video, which is every Monday. So thank you again so much for listening today and I will see you next time.